Well, good morning. Our scripture lesson today comes from Luke chapter 7, the first 10 verses. And good morning to you of those of, uh, joining us out there in quote unquote video land. Oh, I don't have my glasses. Gotta have my glasses. Why do you have to have your glasses, Paul? Because my wife will make sure to tell me every single word I miss on the scripture if I'm not wearing them. I'm wearing them, right? Trust me, I know what will happen in the truck if they don't go on my eyes. We want to continue to encourage you out there that uh, we're still raising money for Charles Nayani and building him a house clean up until the end of November. And so we're asking that you send in your donations if you're so led to do so. And thankful for it that we are. I, uh, I love this time of year. Don't you? This is, this is yard sale time of year. It's two times a year, right? You get the yard sales in the spring, you get the yard sales in the fall. The reason you get the yard sales in the spring is because everybody wants to make room so they can buy stuff all through the summer, right? And then in the fall, you have the yard sales to get rid of all the stuff that you thought you wanted but you didn't want, and now they've got to become somebody else's problem. And of course, I love going to yard sales because I love seeing everybody else's problem and making it my own. And at this particular juncture, I stopped at a yard sale Thursday afternoon on the way home from work, and I was looking around at all the stuff, and I was like, man, look at all this stuff. And I walked by, and there was a riding mower for sale. Uh-oh. Well, let me just walk over and have a look at this riding mower. And as I got near to it, the riding mower said, I had a sign on it. It said $25. I said, my goodness gracious. I started reaching for my wallet and I called and a young fellow was helping his dad and he comes over there and he goes, are you sure you want to buy this thing? I said, well, sure, I want to buy this thing. He goes, hey, I think I recognize you. I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a famous person. He goes, ain't you a preacher? I said, yeah, and he snatched the sign off the lawnmower. Well, what's that all about? Because I can't sell this thing to you. I said, what do you mean? My daddy said that if anybody comes along today to buy this mower, make sure they're not religious because to get this thing started, you have to lose it. <laughs> I didn't take it home with me. <laughs> Look, they're going on, see, on the eyes. Luke, <laughs> Luke chapter 7, for the sermon so precious. And when Jesus had finished saying all this, in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them and he was not far from the house and the centurion sent friends to him to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. Turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Let us ask God for His addition of blessings to the service as we come before Him in prayer. Please join with me. Father, the ramblings in my head, Father, need to be coalesced. And only You can do that. These are Your words. This is Your sermon. This is for us to learn from for the week to come. This is for us to grow from. This is for us to go forward with. Father, pray that it makes sense. It strengthens, it teaches, it glorifies, it honors, and it values what we have been given. Father, let us hear these words fully, openly, and with desire. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And all of His children said, Amen. Now, I had to laugh when I started my research for this particular topic because in the research papers, they kept listing this dude as the former, quote-unquote, ruler of Rome. Former. And I thought that was funny because I've never heard it said like that. I've heard it said uh, president or a ruler or whatever. But this man was considered a former ruler of Rome. And his name was, oddly enough, and he ties to us as Christians, Tiberius. Now Tiberius was born 16 November 42 B.C. Now you think about that for a minute. He was born before what? Christ. That's pretty wild. And he lived through the time of it. In our own Bible, the Gospels mention Tiberius all through the Bible. Make sure I get heard. Because he, Jesus of Nazareth preached during his reign. Tiberius. The Roman governor of the Judea province answered to him. Pontius Pilate did. Tiberius is mentioned in Luke chapter 3. He states many things about his life throughout the Bible. During his reign, Jews had become more prominent in Rome, and Jewish and Gentile followers of Jesus began proselytizing. I guess I'm getting that word right. And Roman citizens began to get mad at the Jewish and the Christians. And Tiberius' answer was to conscript all Jewish men into service. And those that wouldn't, he run them out of the city because he got tired of the fight between the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, Tiberius' history is cloudy, dark, foreboding. Had he died in A.D. 23, he would have been considered a great ruler because he did not believe in conquest and war, except where absolutely necessary. He didn't believe because somebody made him mad in some little town that he should march legions of Romans in there and level the town. He built up the funding and in fact strengthened the Roman Empire. But unfortunately, absolute power corrupts. Isn't that the old saying, power corrupts? And absolute power corrupts absolutely. I think I got it close to being right. And as he became more into the power, he began to listen to the wrong people. And so by the time of his death, in March of A.D. 37, at 78 years old, as he lay trying to recuperate from a bout of pneumonia, Caligula came in, with helpers, and smothered him to death. Now, all of that means nothing. As a matter of fact, the greatness that he was was diminished away. He was so precious, get that as we start to tie it, he was so precious to the Roman people that they turned their backs on him after his death and asked that his body be thrown into the river and destroyed, which was saved for the lowliest of criminals. But the truth of the matter is, he was quietly cremated and his ashes were put in a mausoleum. And in A.D. 410, during one of the conquests of Rome, they were discovered and they were scattered accordingly. But Tiberius left us with something today that you may not know about, yet you see that all the time. You see it everywhere. Tiberius had forethought. Tiberius had vision. We're going to try this. Oh, you got to lift that thing up carefully because it weighs a long ton. Tiberius had vision. And he decided that the health of his people was more worth anything than anything else on the planet. And so Tiberius decreed that what would keep the doctors at bay, what would make everybody safe from everything was... Cucumber. Why are you laughing? This is a health food. He looked at the cucumber. He said, look, the seeds, the green, the skin, all of that. Cucumber a day will keep the doctor away. Right? And he believed in it. During his 
his reign, after studying it, he came to know that these were precious. They were easily grown. Apple trees can live in some pretty severe conditions. And then somebody introduced Tiberius to the thing that would change his life and would change the direction of the world history as we know it today that would affect us even today. You can pick this up in magazines. If you're industrious, you can make it on your own. You can come up with your own way. They, they're everywhere. And because he was introduced to what would change the world, he saw it as being so precious, it needed to be protected. He was introduced to the orange. Now, oranges don't grow in Rome very well. The climate's not there, it's not right. The oranges came from during conquest. And after biting into the orange and deciding its health benefits, bleh, to the cucumber. The cucumber went out the door. As a matter of fact, the orange gave birth to something called an orangery. You want to say that with me? Orangery. It's hard to say ain't it, without giggling. You're like, what is this dumb stuff? Orangery, really, Paul? I'm not that childish. Oh, I'm serious. Tiberius gave birth to the orangery because of the orange, because of a fruit that was so precious it needed to be protected. What is an orangery, you might ask? And I'm sure you following along at home are doing the same thing. Well, because I went to college, I'm ready to tell you. I didn't go to college. I drove through it. Right, okay, got it. The orangery. In Rome, members of the ruling class, members of those that had money and prestige, had deemed such a precious fruit was so vital to the survival of the Roman Empire they built buildings called orangeries. They were great arched structures with brick and stucco. And where they needed to get sunlight in, they used translucent stone slate on the roof of the orangery. And they were all situated in such a way that they would catch the sun as it came up in the east, but not directly in the east, so as to burn the fruit. They were situated southeast. And the orangeries had benches in them and fountains and they were tended to and guarded. If you went into an orangery without permission, you were killed on the spot. This fruit was so precious that that's what it came to be. The orangery. And as would have, luck would have it, the orangeries caught on. They started out growing in Italy. They began to become seen as a sign of wealth. And by the 17th to 19th centuries, orangeries were everywhere. If you had a plantation, if you had a home, if you had anything that had any value to it or any worth, you had to have an orangery. In the Renaissance gardens, by 1702, they became the place to go to find them. Not realizing that oranges would grow and could be shipped, they couldn't. In the United States, the oldest surviving orangery, what's left of it anyhow, lives in Mount Airy, Virginia. Yeah, I said Mount Airy, Virginia, not Mount Airy, Maryland. The, Ron and Liz, do you know where Mount Airy, Virginia is? No, that's not down there far enough. I'm going to have to look it up one day. It is the oldest living pieces of an orangery at a place called a Taylor House, but it is grown in ruin. It has run over. The oldest surviving in existence orangery that still can be used today dates back to the 18th century at a little place called the Y Plantation in Easton, Maryland. It is still in existence today, and you can tour it. And for those of you who do not know, the Y Plantation is still inhabited by the original descendants that built that 13,000 acre compound. Still to this day. And you can tour it. As a matter of fact, when the orangeries fell out of favor because of a certain reason, they turned it into a billiards room. 
And they had multiple pool tables in there, and they would go and they would sip their tea, and they would play snooker and billiards, and they would, oh, 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 and they would eat cucumber sandwiches. But all of this means nothing, because you cannot build an orangery on a hot dog and beans budget. And in 1948, in an effort to try to see things grow, we enter into a picture that ties us back to Tiberius. And his name is Emery Myers Emery. In 1948, because of limited space where he was learning, the doctor decided that polycarbonate or polyethylene, you may know it as plastic, could be used over top of steel tube structures. And he could begin to grow plants and vegetables year-round, and hence grew the modern greenhouse. How many people have seen a greenhouse in the backyard? Right? Put your hands up, TV people. I'm going to come to your house. They're everywhere. My, my nephew has a greenhouse in his backyard, and he's big time into it. My uncle and aunt have one. You can pick up a catalog today. The catalog's called Farm Tech if you ain't never seen it. And you can choose your greenhouse and you can design it and you can have it delivered to your house for $299 plus tax. And you can set up and you can grow stuff all year round. Don't get any funny ideas, lady. I'm speaking to my wife. You know, you can have a window box greenhouse. Anybody have window box greenhouses where you can grow things like basil and thyme and rosemary and some of them other weird herbs and spices. All of this, because of something deemed so precious, grew into the mainstream. And yet, how precious is an orange anymore? Right? I'll tell you the story behind this. When I got up this morning, I went to our fruit basket to get an orange. We don't have any oranges. I thought we did, but we didn't have any oranges. We had a cucumber. And we had an apple. The reason we have a cucumber is because nobody really likes cucumbers unless they're made into pickles anyway. Although I do like them in my salad. And we have plenty of apples. And so I was like, ugh, I know we're never going to get out of this house in time in order for us to stop the grocery store and get an orange so I can have it for a demonstration. Oh, woe is me. I did not prepare. And I picked up the phone and I said, Peggy! And Peggy Kiefer, who's back here, y'all can turn around and look at her. But why is your face all red, Peggy? Peggy said, I got it covered. Peggy went down to the grocery store this morning and picked me up an orange. That's how easy they are to come by today. From something. So That's great, isn't it? I was touching the orange, wasn't I? That is how precious that's become. Not. Went from something so precious that it was guarded with people's lives to you can walk down there and stand at the grocery store and watch women go. I don't know if that's fresh. And if you're a man like me, you pick up the orange when you go there and you go, yeah, that sounds about right. We tend to be forgetting sometimes of what is truly precious in our life. If you grew up long before I was born in the 40s, 30s, and even into the 50s, you got these things in your sock at Christmas because they were considered precious. And we still get them in our socks at Christmas time. Santa Claus, don't you tell me he ain't real. Santa Claus still brings me oranges at Christmas time, and I eat them right away. But we have forgotten just how precious we are sometimes. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves that we are so precious that Jesus Christ saved us. Let's go back to the scripture for a moment. This Scripture gets used in a whole bunch of different ways, and that's fine. The beauty of Scripture is you look at it through what they call, if you're in the doctrinal studies and you're a theologian, you look at it through what they call Scripture lenses, which means a Scripture can have a different value, a different weight, or be so precious at a certain moment depending on when it's called for in time. And the story of the centurion is one we all know, but have we ever looked at it through this lens. The story starts off, not the story, the Scripture starts off by saying, when Jesus had finished saying all this, you have to back up a little bit into the sixth, the sixth chapter of Luke 
where Jesus is talking about the man who built his house on the sand. He's talking about the solid foundation that you need to have to walk with our Lord. Sunday school teachers, you remember it, right? The wise man built his house upon the rocks. Right? The wise man. I love that. And the rain came tumbling down. And he just got done talking about that. I see all them smiles out there. I see you smiling in video land too because you remember. When Jesus had finished saying all this, in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And there a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, so precious, was sick and about to die. Now a centurion in the Roman Empire was a man. I mean, he was a man of worth. You know, he had people go out in the morning when he got ready to start a tour and they started up his chariot for him to make sure it was running right. They tested his food to make sure it was the right temperature. And he had a servant, the Bible makes note of, that he valued. Do you understand the worth and power and weight of those words? The centurion, the man who was up here, valued his servant. Is so precious. Get it? He was dying. A centurion, a Roman, a person who believes in God's and the power of Tiberius heard of Jesus. And his mind was changed. And the Bible records that he sent out to Jesus. He grabbed a hold of the elders of the Jews. The elders of the Jews. Even those he asked to go talk to Jesus were not necessarily believers that Jesus was the Messiah. Go to this man. Ask him to come and heal my servant. That next verse deserves a sermon all in of itself. Because the centurion had so much power, he could take the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the elders, the teachers, the leaders of the Jewish faith, and command them, go get Jesus and bring Him here. And they had to listen. Because that servant was so precious. The Bible records that when they came to Him, they pleaded with Him earnestly. Again, you start to feel the weight of these Scriptures. They had to beg Jesus Christ that they didn't believe in. Hey, look, man, this, this guy's sick, and his boss wants us to bring you, and if we don't bring you, he's going to get mad and hurt us. Please, please, please come. Look, if you need a reason, Jesus, listen. The man built synagogues for us. He, he likes us, and we like him. So Jesus went with him, and he was not far off when the centurion's heart was breaking and said, I'm not worthy to have you in my house. Just say the words. That's all you got to do. Just say the words. I know you can do it. He, the Bible says, but say the word, my servant will be healed, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Do you understand the power of that? We have a cat. And when we say to that cat, come, that cat, well, let me tell you about our cat. We, th we took the screen out of the screen door a long time ago because the cat would climb up the screen door trying to get in the house. And I got tired of fixing it. Now she jumps up inside what's left of the screen door on the middle frame and she sits there and she puts her little nose up against the glass at the front door and she bangs her door back and forth to get our attention. And we are her servants. Do you understand me? We go over to the door. Now, I'm telling you how this works. I am a big man. And I'll go over to that door and I will open that door up and that cat will sit on that frame of that door and look at me and go, well, it's about time. I'm like, would you like to come in? I haven't made up my mind yet. <laughs> come in the house. No, I don't think I'm ready. Would you please come in the house? Well, if you want me to, and this will happen every time. It'll take five minutes for her to come in. I can't control or command nothing. I can't control or command my own family. 
Hey, come here for a minute. Please, come here. And the centurion is saying that I have this great power, and yet I do not consider myself worthy in the face of so precious a Jesus Christ to have you come in the house and do anything for me. Just say the words. And the Bible records that Jesus was amazed. Brothers and sisters, that's where we need to regain our faith. We need to be amazed at our faith and the work that Jesus does, that the Holy Spirit does, that God has given us because we are so precious. Amen. He was amazed. I love that statement in the Bible. Can you imagine being the guy that amazes Jesus Christ? I would think that that would be something you'd think about. When the scripture writer, when, when Luke was putting this down and he wrote those words, I'm amazed by the dumbest things. I'm still amazed by people that can pull a quarter out of my ear. I know how the trick is done. Oh, look, and they pull a quarter out. I've tried to do it. I can't even find anything in my ear but dirt. We are so precious. And the Bible records it. I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned and they found the servant well. So precious. So precious that that's how much we're protected. So precious that Jesus Christ loves us. That the way He built our orangery, our greenhouse, our ability to grow in times of trial and tribulation was that He died for us. Because we are so precious. And He didn't just die for you Christians. Because you weren't Christians at first. No, He died for all of us. He died for all sinners. You know, we have things in our life, don't we, that we consider that are just so precious. Say amen. Right? I know everybody around here has stuff that they wrap up and they hide from the world. And you've got to be, you've got to pass the test, right? You've got to go through the fourth door of knowledge into the hall of, of wisdom and come around the corner and get the golden key to get somebody to open something up in their house that they keep wrapped up and hidden and it's so precious that they'll pull it out a little bit and they'll say, look at this. Right? We all have that. And then they wrap it back up and they put it away. I've got a buddy that collects pocket watches. A certain variety and style. He has so many pocket watches and he is so careful with them, he don't even keep them in his house. He keeps them in a bank 15 miles away. In a vault. And he goes there sometimes and looks at them. And I asked him one time, I said, you got the, he said, oh, i got a pocket watch in there that's worth $15,000. Well, that's cool. Well, I'm, I'd like to see it. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. I couldn't bring it out in the open. Why not? Well, because this is my retirement one day. Mm, so precious. And then I have my other buddy who spent an incredible amount of time rebuilding an old car, a very unique old car. Most of them now that, of that age are. He spent years rebuilding it. When he got it done, the first thing he did was take it out for a drive to Walmart. He drove it to Walmart. Now, if that ain't the most dangerous place in the world to take a vehicle, because the spaces are this close together and the cars are this wide, so your doors are going to hit something, right? Can you imagine me trying to get out of a car in a Walmart parking lot? I have to <gasps> and to get out of the car. He said, I drove to Walmart because we needed some stuff for the house. And he drives that thing all the time. He drives it everywhere. I said, my goodness, man. He said, I did not build this thing to be so precious that it would sit and rot in my garage. I want to enjoy it now. I can fix anything that gets broke on it. I've already proven that. I said, well, let me drive it. He said, no, I couldn't do that. <laughs> well, okay, I know how precious it is now. He told me, he said, when we started working on this thing, I recorded the mileage. 
said, I've put three times the amount of miles on it since I've restored it than it came with originally. See, that's the idea of so precious that it's out there to be seen. That's the lesson to us, that God sees us as something so precious that He built a way to protect us so that we can live. And I don't know, maybe, I, maybe the truth has to be talked about time and time again of just how precious we are so we don't forget. Paul recorded these words in Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, but so precious, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though a good man someone might possibly dare to die for. Verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because we are so precious. So precious. Do you know there are things around us that teach us how precious we are? Because God has given us things in our life that are precious. Things like a baby's laugh. Who thinks about that? The first time you hear a little brand new baby giggle or gurgle, right? I don't care who you are. You can be the toughest man on the face of this planet. I've seen full grown grandfathers, man. Big burly men, beards down to here. Walk around chewing on nails because they don't get enough iron in their diet. I'm a man! And they lay that little squirming baby in grandpap's arms. And grandpap looks down at it. And the baby tugs the little grand, the grandpap's beard and goes, <laughs> and the like, oh, look at the little girl. And the tears come down through the beard. Right? So precious. How about a kitten purring? Ain't that precious? Or a puppy's breath. If I hear that one more time, oh, puppy breath is so precious. I just, I love to smell it. No, I don't think it is. But there are people that believe it. Puppy breath. Now, if you're of the farm-minded type, like I am, what you might consider precious is when a calf stands up after being born for its first time and starts bawling. Oh, I love that sound. We're going to give them a little hug and everything. So precious. And I bet you all thought that I was going to say that when an old engine that hasn't run forever cackles to life for the first time, that that would be so precious. That's what you all thought. See, now you all think you know me. And you're right. The centurion is the amplification of this. It was reported that 11 millionaires went down on the Titanic. Major A.H. Pantron, who survived, left $300,000 in 1912 money in money, jewelry, and securities in a box in his cabin. Later on, writing about it, that money, he said, seemed like a mockery at that time. He said, on my way out to the water, I picked up three oranges instead. So precious. How precious. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. So precious. T. Payne said, What we obtain too cheap we esteem too lightly. Tis dearness only that gives everything its value. We are not cheap. We are not unvaluable. We are so precious in the sight of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such a great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to remind yourself that in the middle of all this trouble, in the middle of all this pain, you are still so precious that you were built into a protected building. And that is the body of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You for the things that You teach us. We thank You for the things that are precious. And we thank You for the things that we suffer. Father, I ask that You take a moment and remind us in those quiet times that Jesus Christ died because we are so precious. Watch over and keep us, Father, through this message. In His name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you have a particular need, the bench is open up here. If you're out there in video land needing prayer, as always, come get a hold of me. Call me, email me, I don't know. Or find someone close to you that knows the Bible and pray with you. And may God add His blessings to each and every one of you.